It's the Second World War, a German prison camp, and this man, Archie Cochrane, is a prisoner of war and a doctor, and he has a problem. The problem is that the men under his care are suffering from an excruciating and debilitating condition that Archie doesn't really understand. The symptoms are this horrible swelling up of fluid under the skin. But he doesn't know whether it's an infection, whether it's to do with malnutrition. He doesn't know how to cure it. And he's operating in a hostile environment. And people do terrible things in wars. Uh, the German camp guards, they've got bored. They've taken to just firing into the prison camp at random for fun. On one particular occasion, one of the guards threw a grenade into the prisoner's lavatory while it was full of prisoners. He said he heard suspicious laughter. And Archie Cochrane, as the camp doctor, was one of the first men in to clear up the mess. On one more thing, Archie was suffering from this illness himself. So the situation seemed pretty desperate, uh, but Archie Cochrane was a resourceful person. He had already smuggled vitamin C into the camp, and now he managed to get hold of supplies of Marmite on the black market. Now, some of you will be wondering what Marmite is. Uh, Marmite is a breakfast spread, beloved of the British. Um, it looks like crude oil. It tastes um, zesty. <laughs> and importantly, uh, it's a rich source of vitamin B12. So Archie splits the men uh, under his care as best he can into two equal groups. He gives half of them vitamin C. He gives half of them vitamin B12. He very carefully and meticulously notes his results in an exercise book. And after just a few days, it becomes clear that whatever is causing this illness, Marmite is the cure. So Cochrane then goes to the Germans who are running the prison camp. Now, you've got to imagine at the moment, forget this photo, imagine this guy with this, this long ginger beard and this shock of red hair. He hasn't been able to shave. A sort of Billy Connolly figure. Cochrane starts ranting at these Germans in this Scottish accent, in fluent German, by the way, but in a Scottish accent, and it explains to them how uh, German culture was the culture that gave Schiller and Goethe to the world, and he can't understand how this barbarism can be tolerated, and he said he vents his frustrations. And then he goes back to his quarters, breaks down and weeps, because he's convinced that the situation is hopeless. But a young German doctor picks up Archie Cochrane's exercise book and says to his colleagues, this evidence is incontrovertible. If we don't supply vitamins to the prisoners, it's a war crime. And the next morning, supplies of vitamin B12 are delivered to the camp, and the prisoners begin to recover. Now, I, I'm not telling you this story because I think Archie Cochrane is a dude, although Archie Cochrane is a dude. <laughs> I'm not even telling you this story because I think we should be running you know, more carefully controlled, randomized trials in all aspects of public policy, although I think that would also be completely awesome. I'm telling you this story because Archie Cochrane, all his life, fought against a terrible affliction. And he realized it was debilitating to individuals, and it was corrosive to societies. And he had a name for it. He called it the God Complex. Now, I can describe the symptoms of the God Complex very, very easily. So the symptoms of the God Complex are, uh, no matter how complicated the problem, you have an absolutely overwhelming uh, belief uh, that you are infallibly right in your solution. Now, Archie was a doctor, so he hung around with doctors a lot, and doctors suffer from the God complex a lot. Now, I'm an economist, I'm not a doctor, but I see the God complex around me all the time in my fellow economists, I see it in our business leaders, I see it in the politicians we vote for, people who, in the face of an incredibly complicated world, are nevertheless absolutely convinced that they understand the way that the world works. And you know, with, with the future billions that we've been hearing about, the world is simply far too complex to understand in that way. I mean, let, let me give you an example. 
Imagine for a moment that instead of Tim Harford in front of you, uh, there was Hans Rosling presenting his graphs. You know Hans, you know, the, the Mick Jagger of TED. <laughs> and he'd, he'd be showing you these amazing statistics, these amazing animations, and they, they are brilliant. It's wonderful work. But a typical Hans Rosling graph, think for a moment not what it shows, but think instead about what it leaves out. So it'll show you GDP per capita, population, longevity, that's about it. So three pieces of data for each country. Three pieces of data. Three pieces of data is nothing. I mean, have a look at this graph. This is produced by the physicist Cesar Hidalgo. He's at MIT. And you won't be able to understand a word of it. You know, just, this is what it looks like. Cesar has trawled a database of uh, over 5,000 different products. And he's used techniques of network analysis to interrogate this database and to graph relationships between the different products. And it's wonderful, wonderful work. You show all these interconnections, all these interrelations. Uh, and I think it'll be profoundly useful in understanding how it is that economies grow. Brilliant work. Um, Cesar and I uh, tried to write a piece for the New York Times magazine explaining how this worked. And what we learned was Cesar's work is far too good to explain in the New York Times magazine. But 5,000 products, that's still nothing. And 5,000 products. Imagine counting every product category in Cesar Hidalgo's data. Imagine you had one second per product category. In about the length of this session, you would have counted all 5,000. Now imagine doing the same thing for every different type of product on sale in Walmart. There are 100,000 there. It would take you all day. Now imagine trying to count every different specific product and service on sale in a major economy such as Tokyo, London, or New York. It's even more difficult in Edinburgh because you have to count all the whiskey and the tartan. Okay? <laughs> if you wanted to count every product and service on offer in New York, there are 10 billion of them, it would take you 317 years. This is how complex the economy we've created is. And I'm just counting toasters here. I'm not trying to solve the Middle East problem. I mean, this is, the, the complexity here is unbelievable. On just a, a piece of context, the societies in which our brains evolved had about 300 products and services. You can count them in five minutes. So this is the complexity of the world that surrounds us. This perhaps is why we find the God complex so tempting. We tend to sort of retreat and say, oh, we can draw a picture, we can show some graphs, and we get it. We understand how this works, and we don't. We never do. Now, I, I'm not trying to deliver a nihilistic message here. I'm not trying to say we, we can't solve complicated problems in a complicated world. We clearly can, but the way we solve them is with humility, to abandon the com God complex and to actually use a problem-solving technique that works. And we, we have a problem-solving technique that works. Now, you show me a successful, complex system, and I will show you a system that has evolved through trial and error. Here's an example. This baby was produced through trial and error. I realize that's an ambiguous statement. Uh, maybe I should clarify it. This baby, it's a human body. It evolved. What is evolution? Over millions of years, variation and selection. Variation and selection. Trial and error trial and error. And it's not just biological systems that produce miracles through trial and error. And you could use it in an industrial context. So let's say, let's say you wanted to make detergent. Let's say you're Unilever and you want to make detergent in a factory near Liverpool. How do you do it? Well, you have this great big tank full of liquid detergent. You pump it at a high pressure through a nozzle. You create a spray of detergent. Then the spray dries, it turns into powder, it falls to the floor, you scoop it up, you put it in cardboard boxes, you sell it at a supermarket, you make lots of money. How do you design that nozzle? Turns out to be very important. Now, if you ascribe to the God complex, what you do is you find yourself a little God. You find yourself a mathematician, you find yourself a physicist, somebody who understands the dynamics of this fluid, and uh, he will or she will calculate the optimal design of the nozzle. Now, Unilever did this, and it didn't work. Too complicated. Even this problem, too complicated. 
But the geneticist, Professor Steve Jones, describes how Unilever actually did solve this problem. Trial and error, variation and selection. You take a nozzle and you create 10 random variations on the nozzle. You try out all 10. You keep the one that works best. You create 10 variations on that one. You try out all 10. You keep the one that works best. You try out 10 variations on that one. You see how this works, right? And after 45 generations, you have this incredible nozzle, looks a bit like a chess piece, functions absolutely brilliantly. We have no idea why it works. No idea at all. But the moment you step back from the God complex and you say, let's just try a bunch of stuff, let's have a systematic way of determining what's working and what's not, you can solve your problem. Now, this process of trial and error is actually far more common in successful institutions than we care to recognize. And we, we've heard a lot about how economies function. Now, the US economy is still the world's greatest economy. How did it become the world's greatest economy? I, I mean, I could, um, I could give you all kinds of facts and figures about the US economy, but I think the most salient one is this. 10% of American businesses disappear every year. That is a huge failure rate. It's far higher than the failure rate for, say, you know, Americans. 10% of Americans don't disappear every year, which leads us to conclude you know, American businesses fail faster than Americans, and therefore American businesses are evolving faster than Americans, and you know, eventually they'll have evolved to such a high peak of perfection that they will make us all their pets. <laughs> if, of course, they haven't already done so. I sometimes wonder. Um, but it's this process of trial and error that explains you know, th this great divergence, this incredible performance of Western economies. It didn't come because you put some incredibly smart person in charge. It's come through trial and error. Now, I've been sort of banging on about this for the last couple of months, and people sometimes say to me, oh, well, Tim, it's kind of obvious. You know, obviously, trial and error is very important. Obviously, experimentation is very important. You know, why, are you, why are you just sort of wandering around saying this obvious thing? I say, okay, fine, you think it's obvious. I will admit it's obvious when schools start teaching children that there are some problems that don't have a correct answer. Stop giving them lists of uh, questions, every single one of which has an answer, and there's an authority figure in the corner behind the teacher's desk who knows all the answers, and if you can't find the answers, you must be lazy or stupid. When schools stop doing that all the time, I will admit that, yes, it's obvious that trial and error is a good thing. When a politician stands up campaigning for elected office and says, I want to fix our health system, I want to fix our education system, I have no idea how to do it. I've got a, a half a dozen ideas. We're going to test them out. They'll probably all fail. Then we'll test some other ideas out. We'll find some that work. We'll build on those. We'll get rid of the ones that don't. When a politician campaigns on that platform, and more importantly, when voters like you and me are willing to vote for that kind of politician, then I will admit that it is obvious that trial and error works, and that thank you. <laughs> Until then, until then, I'm going to keep banging on about trial and error and why we should abandon the God complex. Because it's, it's so hard to admit our own infallibility. It's so uncomfortable. And Archie Cochran understood this as well as anybody. I mean, there's this one um, trial he ran many years after World War II. He wanted to test out um, the question of where is it that patients should recover from uh, heart attacks. Should they recover in a, in a specialized cardiac unit in hospital, or should they recover at home? All the cardiac doctors tried to shut him down. They had the God complex in spades. They knew that their hospitals were the right place for patients, and they knew it was very unethical to run any kind of trial or experiment. Nevertheless, Archie managed to uh, get permission to do this. He ran his trial. And after the trial had been running for a little while, he gathered together all his colleagues around this, uh, the table, and he said, well, gentlemen, we have some preliminary results. They are not statistically significant, uh, but, you know, we have something, and it turns out you're right, and I'm wrong. It is dangerous for patients to recover from heart attacks at home. They should be in hospital. 
And there's this uproar, and all the doctors start pounding the table and saying, we always said you're unethical, aren't you? You're killing people with your clinical trials. You need to shut it down now. Shut it down at once. And there's all this huge hubbub. Archie lets it die down. And then he says, well, that's very interesting, gentlemen, because when I gave you the table of results, I swapped the two columns around. It turns out your hospitals are killing people, and they should be at home. Would you like to close down the trial now, or shall we wait until we have robust results? Tumbleweed <laughs> rolls through, <laughs> through the meeting room. But you know, Cochrane would do that kind of thing. And the reason he would do that kind of thing is because he understood it feels so much better to stand there and say, yeah, in my own little world, I am a god, I understand everything. I do not want to have my opinions challenged. I do not want to have my conclusions tested. It feels so much more comfortable simply to lay down the law. Cochrane understood that uncertainty, that fallibility, that being challenged, they hurt. And you sometimes need to be shocked out of that. Now, I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. It isn't easy. It's incredibly painful. And since I started talking about this subject and researching this subject, I've been really haunted by something a Japanese mathematician said on the subject. So shortly after the war, this young man, uh, Yutaka Taniyama, developed this amazing conjecture called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. It turned out to be absolutely instrumental many decades later in proving Fermat's last theorem. In fact, it turns out it's equivalent to proving Fermat's last theorem. You prove one, you prove the other. But it was always a conjecture. Taniyama tried and tried and tried, and he could never prove that it was true. And shortly before his 30th birthday in 1958, Yutaka Taniyama killed himself. His friend, Goroshimura, who worked on the mathematics with him, many decades later, reflected on Taniyama's life. He said, he was not a very careful person as a mathematician. He made a lot of mistakes. But he made mistakes in a good direction. I tried to emulate him, but I realized it is very difficult to make good mistakes. Thank you.